Well, good evening. How's everybody doing? Good. I'm going to stand up here just because I'm not tall enough, apparently. Uh, my name is Patrick Gray, and uh, a few years ago, I had the pleasure of meeting Steve at Willow Creek, Steve Carter. And he's one of those guys that when you meet him, you just he's just fun to hang out with. He's just got this presence that just makes you want to just, just listen to him tell stories and share parts of your story with him. And he's just a fun guy to hang with. And, uh, you know, over the years, we've, uh, we've texted back and forth about football, words of encouragement, you know, just conversations. And, uh, and it's just been a, a gift to get to know him. And uh, for those of you that were here Sunday, you may have figured out from his, uh, his sermon that uh, he played some college basketball. And uh, Brent and I were chatting earlier about, okay, wh what kind of player was this guy? I'm curious. Uh, you got deer in the headlights right now. Like, what, what's he going to say? And Brent, you came across a story um, that actually I think you told. And I, I'm, we, we read that? Yeah. yeah, this is out of your blog. So I don't know if you remember this, but um, do you remember vlogging before? Uh, I had the privilege when I went to Cal State to walk onto the basketball team. That's very admirable. I used to take the pride in the probable fact that I was the worst D1 college player in all of 1999. At one point during the season, I overheard some opposing fans asking if I was the coach's son. <laughs> I laughed so hard from the end of the bench. And so we decided to pull up some stats on you. Yeah. Pull those up. Let's see those stats. This is 1999. 1999. Do you remember Ike Harmon? Yeah, yeah? okay. Not bad, 15.7 points a game. That's pretty good. How about Mar Mark Murphy? No. no. Okay, here's the deal. Here's the deal is that I don't even see your name on the roster. <laughs> Were you like the practice team? <laughs> oh, seriously. I, I was, <laughs> oh, man. Well, here's the deal. We thought we would give you the opportunity to actually get some stats, like be on the board. So here you go. Here's, here's your opportunity. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Not really. <laughs> there you go. Can you sink it right here? Just one shot. Just, just entertain how, us. How much? How much? <laughs> oh. What for do? Oh. Okay, I'm beginning to see why you're on the scout team. <laughs> all right. Okay, but serious, in all seriousness, though, uh, I'm sorry, Steve. I, I can resist. No, but this is a guy who, um, he's got a, a, a lot of gifts, and it, the one that struck me the most is he has a gift of telling stories, stories that, that just draw you in to the meaning behind the stories, and what I love about him is that all those stories, time and time again, point people to Jesus. This guy, his passion is for people to know Jesus and, and just to press into the love that, that he offers us. And so with that, I'm so excited for tonight to listen to more stories from Steve Carter. Thank you, thank you. Oh. Man, that's a, that's, a, that's a humbling way to begin right there. 0 for 3. Um, hope that's not a foreshadow of my third time teaching. Um, but hey, it's such an honor to be here. Let, let's just be honest. Um, relationships are difficult, aren't they? I mean, it'd be really easy to live an invitational life if it was just you. Right? And if people were like you, and they dressed like you, and they liked the same teams as you, and they voted like you, and they had the same beliefs as you, right? It'd be really, really easy. But let's just be honest. Like, people, people are weird. <laughs> people are really strange. And, and, and sometimes it doesn't matter where you are. You're just interacting with people, and, um, yeah, it's just, it's just, it just gets hard. Right? And, and, and sometimes it's by the team that they root for. Sometimes it's by their unique complexities. I, I like the way that my dad um, spoke about this. I remember I brought a girl home uh, for dinner one night from college. And then she went off and, and was with her family. And, um, and I, I, I was so excited to get my dad's take on what he thought of this girl. And he goes, uh, it, it doesn't matter. And I said, what? It does. I want your, like, validation. He goes, no, 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 I think you're just looking at this whole thing called relationships wrong. 
I said, like, what do you mean? He said, you got to understand, every person you meet has crazy in them. <laughs> and you just have to find who's crazy you can live with and not wake up every morning trying to fix and change. Find that person, marry them as quick as possible. <laughs> but I, I've thought about this, right? Because every person we encounter has got a little crazy in them. And just look to the person to the right of you and say, you got crazy. <laughs> you got crazy. Poor guy walking into church right now, just everyone's looking at him. But uh, you got crazy, right? And, and, and some of it is, is, is kind of adorable. Some of it's kind of obnoxious. But we've got crazy. And, and yet with that, Jesus teaches us how we're supposed to interact. And so if you have a Bible, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. I think it's just so powerful. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3. This is this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Just put that on your mirror. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And it's just so powerful. It would have been so easy for Jesus to stay in heaven. It would have been easier for his reputation. <laughs> but if Jesus cared about his reputation, he would have never left heaven. It would have been easier for him to not have to deal with the religious elite. It would have been easier for him to not have to deal with the tax collectors and the zealots. It would be so much easier for him to not have to deal with false kings. He did, it would be so much easier and yet... He lived this way in such a way that we are called to have the same mindsets in our interactions with others. But it's hard, isn't it? It's really, really hard. And so sometimes when I get up and teach and I talk about this invitational life, I, I have this sense of, man, you know what, you got to understand, we can do this. God wants to use us and there's these only God stories. But I think the same thing is true. What makes it so only God is sometimes we're interacting with people who just frustrate us, annoy us, rub us wrong. And this is what I want to talk to you about today. And this is a message that's going to be for you, for you to be thinking about your own life. And I believe if we can really dive in honestly and look at our own lives honestly through the lens of the cross, when we leave this place and we enter into conversations with those that are a bit harder to deal with, God might teach us something. So let's jump to 1 Peter chapter 1 and we'll continue on there. Verse 1, chapter 1, verse 14 says this. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. So it's people who are obedient to God. People who have had their life kind of transformed by the goodness of the cross. Do not go backwards in your story. But it says this, verse 15. But just as he who called you is holy... So be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. I mean, this is, this is really, really powerful language here. Peter's saying, hey, this is so easy for us. This is like the call for us. Is that in every choice, every decision, every action, we are to be holy people. And the Nazarene faith, they, they've got a high view of holiness, and I respect that. And the understanding of what holiness and being holy is all about is when I think Peter's saying this, is he goes, man, I want you to be whole, holy, and spiritually healthy in all you do. I want you to make decisions from a place where you are whole, that you have been made whole. I want you to make decisions that are set apart, holy, from how the way the world would work. And I want you to make decisions because you have been spiritually healed, spiritually healthy decisions in every interaction. But have you ever thought about this? Why is it that so many times in our day we make decisions that are unholy? Like nobody wakes up 
and goes, you know what I want to do today? I want to train wreck my marriage. <laughs> Nobody wakes up and goes, you know what I want to do? I want to self-sabotage all my personal relationships. You know what I want to do? I want to absolutely wreck my relationships with my kids. No, nobody wakes up and says, you know what, I want to make a ton of unholy decisions. I've never said that in the morning. And yet, I've gone through my day, and I've made choices and decisions, and words have come out of my mouth, and thoughts have been in my mind that are not whole or holy or spiritually healthy. Anyone else honest and say they've had that today? Yeah. Yeah. The rest of you now can raise your hand because you lied. But it's cool. <laughs> but here's this thing, right? We, 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 we do this. So the question is why? Why do we make decisions that are not whole? Well, I want to take you to the city of Chicago. This is where I lived for a number of years. And if you've ever driven in Chicago, you know that Chicago is a very dangerous city. You've seen it on the news. But I'm going to tell you something that's very real and very dangerous, and they're called potholes. <laughs> and they are everywhere. And, and, and you know, you know how potholes happen. I don't know if they're here in Eagle, but literally water freezes and it expands, and the asphalt can't kind of expand with it, so a crater is created in the road. And you're driving, and you're sort of watching the brake lights in front of you, but you're really watching the, the, the road to make sure you don't just hit one of these potholes. And I was driving there a number of months ago, and as I was driving, I was kind of like looking around, and I didn't see that I hit a massive crater, a right front tire. And right away, I realized, oh man, I got a flat. I pulled my car over, I get out, I look, and I'm like, oh. But I remembered that the city of Chicago has a number that you can dial, 311, and you can report a pothole. <laughs> no joke. You can report a pothole because if someone has reported a pothole and the city hasn't fixed it in due time, sometimes the city will take care of the damage to your car. No wonder the state of Illinois is about to go bankrupt. <laughs> so I call 311 and I'm praying and asking God, God, clerical error, please, please. Lady picks up, I tell her where I'm at, she goes, sorry, you're the first one to report it. I'm like, oh man. But the teacher in me keeps the conversation going. And I'm, I'm sitting already waiting another 45 minutes for the tow truck driver to leave the donut shop and come get me, but it's cool. But I'm just sitting there for, for 45 minutes anyway, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking, and I said, hey ma'am, um, you've got your own number. 311. I don't know any other city that I can dial 311 and report a pothole. So how many potholes are in this city of Chicago that you have, like, fixed? She's like, that's a fascinating question. I said, well, thank you. That's very kind of you. She goes, the Chicago Tribune just did a story on, on how many potholes we filled in from January 1st, 2018 to March 22nd, 2018. Do you want to guess? And I said, no. But she said, no, no, please, just guess. And so I said, okay, 15,000. She goes, a little bit more. I said, 20,000. She goes, a little bit more. I said, 25,000. She goes, a little bit more. I said, ma'am, this is like my conversations with my dad. He already knows the answer. <laughs> Just tell me. She goes, okay, we have filled in, in less than 100 days, 190,000 potholes. She goes, if you go to our website, we even have a pothole tracker. No joke. Look at this. They literally show their work. So now I'm really curious, and, and, and I'm beginning to think to myself, you remember like when you were a kid, and you got to bring your dad or your mom to work day, and you're sitting there, I just, I just started thinking about this, and I, this is not going to be funny to any of you but me, but it's okay, I got a mic, and so like I'm sitting here, and I'm like, I'm thinking about this as I'm talking to this woman, like just first grade, little Timmy comes up, and he's like, hi, I'm Timmy. And this is my dad, Khalil Mack. He plays for the Chicago Bears. And everyone's like, oh my goodness, that's so cool. All right, Jimmy, um, what does your dad do? Hi, guys, I'm Jimmy. This is my dad. He runs the pothole tracker on the website. <laughs> and they're like, oh my goodness, that's you. You know, like I just had like this bizarre vision of this. But anyways, they show their work. I asked the, ask the woman, I say, hey, ma'am, please, please help me understand. So what do you do? Like your team like goes out. You got some extra asphalt, you just fill in some holes. She goes, yeah. And then we kind of click the blue circle, we move on to the next one. 
190,000. She goes, yep, and they keep coming. I said, thanks be to Chicago, here we go. And so I, I started thinking about this, like, does this, does this happen all the time? And she goes, well, sometimes we, we go there and we realize, man, there's, this isn't caused by inclement weather. This wasn't caused by water that froze. There's actually something happening that's underneath the surface. A leaky pipe, some kind of erosion that's happening underneath. And no joke, a couple years ago in the city of Chicago, a 72-year-old man was driving and an entire road gave way. And there was a sinkhole, had the ride of his life, went down two stories, went to the hospital, is fine. But I started to think about this. It's amazing because every one of us has potholes. Some of us have 190,000 potholes from our story, from our crazy, from our trauma, from our brokenness, from our decisions, right? And sometimes, sometimes you can have moments in the morning, right, where you were just in the Word, and you're playing some worship music, and you had some strong black coffee, and you were drinking your coffee, singing your worship, and you spent time in the Word, and, and you're, you're getting in your car, and you're driving to work, you're driving to drop your kids off, and all of a sudden some guy cuts you off. And any other moment, when you didn't have time with Jesus and you didn't have your coffee, you might have said something. But because you had your coffee, and because you had time with Jesus, and because you had your worship plan, you just said, hey, it's okay. Grace. Grace to you. Even though you don't care about my family or care about me, grace for you. You're able to just give that away. It's like almost some asphalt covering up that pothole. But there are other potholes that we have. That if we do not tend to in our own story, they will quickly become sinkholes. And they will become sinkholes for others. People will get close to you. And all of a sudden, they get close to you and somehow get close to your pothole. And, and you never dealing with this area in your life. And all of a sudden, you begin to make decisions and choices. And there's this thing about sin. There's always collateral damage. It never just affects you. And really when you think about the word sin in the original language, it means to live less than you were intended. Less than who you were created. Less than. And the truth is for many of us, when we've made decisions that are less than what God intended of us, we try to fill that less than with something to make us feel okay. And this, this gets really, really difficult. And so what I want to do today is I want to talk about this. Because I had this amazing experience a number of years ago when I was living in California and I was working. I had a coworker who reminded me of someone who deeply wounded me. I don't know if you have that in your marketplace, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your school. But someone gets close to you and they remind you of somebody who hurt you. They remind you of an old pothole. And so I go home and I tell my wife, I say, hey babe, I got to tell you this story about this guy. And I'm looking for a little bit of marital support, a little backup. I'm looking for her to jump on the bandwagon of not liking this person. And when I lay the whole thing out and I have pleaded my case, you know what our first response is? Isn't God so kind? What are you talking about? Isn't God so kind? I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean he's so kind? God's so kind because you have spent so many years not dealing with this pothole that he keeps bringing people into your life until you honor its truth. And I looked at her and I said, get behind me, Satan. I did not say that. But here's the thing, here's the thing. She was right. Right? Because sometimes we look at difficult people who are obnoxious to us, difficult people who get close to us, difficult people in our lives, and literally, let's just be really, really honest, they're getting close to a pothole. And maybe God is being so kind to actually use that person to help show us that we need to be made whole in this area. And this is what I want to talk about today. I want to help you get to what I call the thing 
beneath the thing. And this is my hope. My hope, and steal this in your marriages. Because it's never about the toilet seat being up. And it's never about whatever the argument is, right? There's always a thing beneath the thing in this conversation. And those are the moments when you get to it. Where you can either do the most amount of damage to yourself in another, or you can actually bring about the most kind of healing. Does this all make sense? So we're going to address some potholes so they don't become sinkholes. And to do that, let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to look at a verse, and you're going to see this kind of verse that we're going to play out. And, and what Peter's just going to say in the first part, he's just going to say, therefore, rid yourselves. That's all he's going to talk about. He's going to rid yourselves. You've got to rid yourselves of a few things. And, and, and I think about when we find ourselves having these moments of actually choosing unholy decisions, it's because we get triggered. We get triggered. And this is what triggers do. Triggers incite a pain point in our story. Triggers. And we all have them, right? Maybe for some of you, it's people who are proud. Maybe for you, it's somebody who believes something different. Maybe for you, it's somebody who voted for, for somebody different than maybe you would have. Maybe for you, it, it's someone who has a different theological idea on this concept or theory. Maybe for you, it, it, it's someone who dresses a certain way. Maybe for you, it's someone who reminds you of somebody who hurt you. But do you understand, every person that we interact with there is a potential that they will trigger a, point, a pain point in your story. And you've got to understand, is when you get triggered, you're going to go somewhere. You are going to go somewhere because you're going to feel less than, and you're going to want to make yourself feel better. And this is what I've found in almost 20 years of pastoring, in sitting with young people, sitting with parents, sitting with grandparents, pastoring larger congregations, sitting with people, mentoring people, and it always comes back to these potholes, these pain points in our stories, these places that we've pushed away. And I believe that God is so kind that he's going to be so relentless in pursuing you so that you will become whole, holy, and spiritually healthy. So let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, 1. He says this, therefore rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit. Of all malice. Malice is kind of an old school word, but, it, but it's kind of this like hidden evil within you. It's, sometimes we won't act on it, but it's like we feel it. We long for something bad to happen to that person. Or the word deceit. And deceit is hiding from our true self. And one of the first places that we will go, takes us back to the garden, is where we get triggered and we all go into hiding. And many of us, when we go into hiding, we are just escaping the pain in our story. You remember in Genesis chapter 3, the man and the woman, they take of the fruit because they believe that they're, God's holding out on them. And the woman eats, she gives them to her husband, he's like, free food, and he eats and all of a sudden, they, they, they feel this sense of anxiety and shame, and they realize that they're naked. And the woman goes, I'm naked, that's so uncool. And the guy's like, you're naked, that's so cool. And like, there's just this, this moment, right? And, and, and so then they, they, they feel like they need to cover themselves up, and so they make clothes, and it doesn't work, right? Because we, we all have that. We have moments where anxiety and shame happen in our story and in our life, and we try to cover it up. We might cover it up with eating. We might cover it up with drinking. We might cover it up with pills. We might cover it up with going maxing out our credit card. But we all try to cover that feeling up, hoping it will take where we feel less than and make it better. And then the scripture says that God was walking in the cool of the day. And they hear God walking. And they go and they hide. And it's the first game of hide and seek ever. And it's crazy. I, I don't know if you like the game of hide and seek, but if you remember playing it, nobody ever wanted to, to say, hey, I'll seek. Everybody wants to hide. Why? Because it's the human condition. We're good at hiding. I remember I grew up 
going to this, this school that was connected to this church and in seventh grade started going to youth group. And the building was like this. And a big building and I loved it. And, and one night we got to play hide and seek. And it was just so fun. And then fast forward a number of years, I got to be intern at this church. And I decided to do a junior high all-nighter. Please, for the love of God, don't ever do this. <laughs> but my whole idea was I was just going to give these kids like jolt soda and just let them drink it. And then I thought they'd have like a total crash and burn at 2.30. It was a terrible idea. But at about 2.30, these kids go, can we play hide and seek? And I'm like, sure. So these kids start running off in the building. And I know this building. I grew up in this building. And within 15 minutes, I got all these kids nailed. I knew where they were. Got them all. And then there was about six junior high girls who came up, and I could see that they were crying. And I'm like, what's going on? Where's Tony? We can't find Tony. And you got to understand, Tony was an eighth grader who was about four foot six, and he was dating a sophomore in high school. Legend. Okay? Just straight legend right there. He already had man voice. He had a deeper voice than me, like, hey, Steve. And I'm like, how do you have this? You're four foot eight in eighth grade. How are you dating a sophomore? I don't even understand this. I couldn't find this kid. And in my mind, I'm like, if he went to Taco Bell and snuck out, this kid's done. But then all of a sudden, I go, I know where he is. And so I start walking through the fellowship hall. I walk through the kitchen area. I walk through a classroom, walk down a long hallway, and I walk right into the sanctuary. And as I walk in the sanctuary, I got 24 students behind me. And I'm walking closer and closer, and this is what I hear. Oh, bu 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 Oh, bu 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 And I'm like, what in the world? Like a squirrel in the AC unit. I get closer and closer to the stage, and that noise gets louder and louder. Oh, bu 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 Oh, bu 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 I walk up on stage, and on our stage, we had a baptismal, which was like a hot tub. And I walk up and I get closer and as I look into this baptismal, there's Tony on his knees with a straw snorkeling in the baptismal. And I look at this kid, I'm like, what are you doing? And there's moments, you got to understand students, that we as parents, we laugh inside. Because you're creative and you're funny. But we can't show you that at all. We will never show you that. And I just said, get out of that. That's holy water. And he's like, I always wanted to be baptized. I'm like, get, I'm going to crush you. Um, I didn't. But I just always think about this, right? God's walking in the cool of the garden. And you know what he says? Where are you? He doesn't come across mad or angry. God asks three words. Where are you? And he's not like, well, where's your GPS location, Adam and Eve? He knows where they are. He knows, what he's asking is, where is the image I put? Where is the potential? Where is the best version of you? Why are you hiding? Question for you to wrestle with right now is when you get triggered, where do you tend to go to escape the pain in your story? Online? On social media? You go and buy something? And, and, and here's the thing, we all do it. We all hide in some capacity. But what we're doing in this moment, instead of being honest and real about the pain point and seeing what God can do, what we're doing is escaping it and prolonging the opportunity to receive healing. Where do you go? And where you go, you deceive yourself and you deceive others. Let's continue on. Back to, to chapter 2. It says, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy and envy. The second place that many of us go when we get triggered, we can go into hiding. The second place we go is in insecurity. And it's the stories we tell about ourselves. And, and many of us do this. And, and, and kind of a way that I think about it is with hypocrisy and with envy. Hypocrisy is, many of you might know this, but it was taken from this word actor. And in Greek culture, in the city of Ephesus, they had amphitheaters and auditoriums that sat 25,000 people. And they'd have one person act. And what they would do is they'd come on stage with a backpack and they'd have multiple masks. And they would put on a mask and they would perform. 
and become a persona for, some, for the crowd. And then they would put a different mask on and be a different voice and a different persona. And this idea of hypocrite became people who could wear masks. And oftentimes, when we get triggered, all of a sudden, for some of us in this room, we tell a story about ourselves that we're not good enough. And we start to play really, really small. And when we start to play really, really small, we just put on this mask. I'm not enough. And for some of us, when we get triggered, the insecurity in the story we tell about ourselves is they see that I'm not good enough, and so some of us power up. And we put a mask, and we kind of just rage, and we kind of act like we have it all together, and pride comes out. And we start to perform, or, or, or we just start to please, or we start to pretend, or we try to act like we're perfect and know it all. And all of this is just leading us into decisions that are unholy. And people watch this. People see this. And people look at this and go, do I want that for my life? This is so dangerous. For some of you, when you get triggered, do you start to tell a story about yourself and make yourself smaller? Or do you tell a story about yourself and try and power up? Because when this happens, man, it can get so dangerous. Let's go back to the scriptures. And it says this. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. See, the other thing that many of us do, the third place that many of us go when we get triggered, is we tell a narrative. And you know what a narrative is? It's the stories we create about others. Because when we get triggered, someone sees a pothole within us, and what happens? We don't want anybody to see that we're not okay or perfect, and none of us are. And so we create a narrative about another person. I call this Plato theology. And what this is, is where we literally start to shape and form another person, another race, another team in our image, and we don't call out the image of God in them. And what this ends up doing is we start to show the rest of other, the world and other people, this is who this person really is. And we get people to buy into it. And literally all it is is because some person got close to our crazy, and we don't have the tools to deal with it, so we create narratives. Does this all make sense? Do you see how this happens? And what this does is it really affects our ability to reach our friends, our family. It really affects our ability to live a life that is just so, so compelling. And on the outside, we might look like we have it all together. But on the inside, people see, I don't know if they really believe. I don't know if they're really living what they're preaching. Let's take this even farther. In the Wall Street Journal, a couple months ago, I don't know if you read this. But you know what the number one kind of fashion that is on the rise right now? Athleta leisure. Lululemon, Athleta, Under Armour, Nike. And, and many women and men are wearing these clothes. They're very tight pants and, 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 and really like athletic shirts. And here's why. Because when you wear this, Everybody thinks that you've just gone to the gym. <laughs> you haven't. And they're like, that person's healthy. That person's healthy. They're really comfortable clothes. But what it gives off is the story of, I put this on, I may go to the gym, i probably not going to the gym, but everybody thinks I'm going to the gym. And I think we have to understand that just because we know certain facts about Jesus, it's different from actually living and like Philippians says in all of our relationships having the same viewpoint that he had uh, let's take it this even a little bit farther February 17th 1963 there's a child that was born in Brooklyn New York his family moved to North Carolina he grew up and he grew up in a, in a family he loved the game of baseball he played a ton of sports he loved his dad loved his grandfather he tried out for 
high school basketball team, as a, as, a, as a junior, as a sophomore, and he got cut at Laney High School. As a junior, he makes the team. As a senior, he's an All-American. As a freshman, he goes to the University of North Carolina, hits the game-winning shot against Patrick Ewing's Georgetown Hoyas. A couple years later, he goes to the NBA. He's drafted number three behind Hakeem Olajuwon and Sam Bowie, poor Sam Bowie. He goes to the city of Chicago. He signs a, a, a deal with Nike. He didn't want to sign a deal with Nike, but they paid him a little bit more. He signs with Nike. I could tell you about how he met his wife at a Bennigan's restaurant. Remember that? I could tell you how they dated, broke up, dated, broke up, and finally they got married. I could tell you the names of his kids. I could tell you the drama on the Dream Team. I could tell you what really happened in the flu game. I could tell you Michael Jeffrey Jordan's stats. But here's the thing. If any of you ever asked me, Steve, have you met him? I'm like, no. You know what we call those people? Stalkers. I know facts about Michael Jeffrey Jordan, but I don't know him. Here's my question to you. Some of you know facts about Jesus, but I'm asking you, do you know him? Because if you know him, you are going to let him into the potholes of your story. Because you don't want them to become sinkholes that end up affecting not just you, but the people you interact with. Your kids, your spouse, your grandkids, your neighbors, the people who are far from God. And here's the thing, there is hope. Because when you get triggered, you don't have to go into hiding. And you don't have to tell a false story about yourself. You don't have to create a false story about another person. You know what, there's hope. And you know what that hope is? It's grace. It's grace. And grace is so beautiful. Because grace is the free gift that makes us whole, holy, and spiritually healthy. Grace is that gift of Jesus saying, I want all of you. Grace is that gift to run after you, to never stop. Grace is that that gift to say, hey, I'm not asking you to be perfect, but I'm asking you to be honest and human. And there's areas in your story that, where people deeply wounded you. But you know what? I'm going to be so kind to you because I don't want you to go through life never dealing with that stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be so kind. I'm going to put people in your life that you, they're going to force you to be either be unholy or to get real honest and allow me to heal you. And this is the game changer. Because when you read... 1 Peter 2, verse 2, you just see it. It says this, Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. I think this is so important, because what I've come to find out, is even though I've studied Hebrew, I've studied Greek, I've been to the Holy Land, I've walked where Jesus has walked, done a lot to know a lot of facts about Jesus. You know what I really, really love are the moments when I trust him with the most broken places in my story. And when I can experience his healing. And I can experience what used to bother me, Ohio State Buckeye fans, and now I can actually try to begin to love them. I, I, I know what it's like when I can, I've seen areas in my life where he's given me patience. Where he's taught me how to actually listen. Where he's helped grow where there was fear. And that only happens when you allow yourself to say, man, like a newborn baby, God help me. And I want to crave grace. And I want to taste and see that grace to taste and see that you are good. When you experience God's grace for you and you trust him with the real places where you're hiding, or the stories and the lies that you're telling about yourself or the stories and lies that you're telling about others and you allow him to get to the thing beneath the thing, he will heal you. And when he heals you, you know what's going to happen? Your life is going to be something that's so desirable that people are going to see and go, I want that. I want that, a grace-filled, patient, humble, kind, joy-filled, 
Jesus-centered life. That's what I want for you. How do we get to the thing beneath the thing? I'm going to invite the band to come up, and, and, and maybe this, this works, and again, maybe it, it's, it's, it fails, but I like, I like to take risks. And I, up on the screen, you're going to see the acronym, Thing Beneath the Thing. And, and, and when it comes up, you're going to see that, that the T is for triggers. The H is for hiding. I is for insecurity, the N is for narrative, the G is for grace. And, and here's what I want you to just take a moment, and I want you to think about this. What triggers you? I really want you to think about this for a moment. What kind of people trigger you? What kind of people are hard for you to actually love like Christ would love? How, what kind of people are difficult for you to have the same mindset that Christ Jesus would have for them? And allow yourself to get curious, why is that? Maybe it's because they're prideful. Maybe it's because they're cynical. Maybe it's because they're arrogant. Maybe it's because they make you feel a little bit less than. And when you start to feel this, ask yourself, where do I go? And maybe for some of you, you found yourself in the last week going in places of hiding, trying to cover up. And we all do it. Some of us just do it in more socially acceptable ways. Maybe it was one extra glass of wine this past week. Maybe it was just a little bit too long on the internet and just led you to certain places that you wish you never would have went. Maybe it just led you to just kind of choosing just secrets and not being open. Maybe it led you just to a place of insecurity. And you just allowed this cloud of shame and lies from the enemy just to fill your mind. And it just almost paralyzed you. I got nothing. I'm not good enough. I could never be used by God. I'm... I, I'm such a mess up. I'm not enough. Or maybe you powered up and you said things to your spouse or said things to somebody else. That's just because someone made you feel less than. Or got too close to your pothole. Or maybe you just started to, to think things about another group of people. Say things and form them in your image instead of calling out the divine in them. And if we're going to live an invitational life, it starts with us saying, Jesus, there's nothing better than grace. And there is so many places in my life that I need grace. Where do you need grace today? The beauty of grace is it's a free gift. But the beauty of grace is grace will find you out. That's how passionate God is for you. Grace will find you out. Grace will chase you down. Grace will give you moments and invitations and opportunities to step into the light and to be seen. And if you're like me, you don't want to. You want to walk away and step into the dark. You don't want the spotlight on you because when the spotlight's on you, everybody can see the gray. And they can see the chimple. They can see the parts of me that I don't want people to see. But until you trust grace, that God is with you and God's for you, you're not going to be able to experience the healing. And when you experience the healing, you will be someone who has been made whole and holy and spiritually healthy. And that's what our world is desperate to see. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to open up the altar. I don't know, it's a Monday night. No real reason. I'm just going to sing a psalm, but maybe for some of you, you just got to think to yourself and just go, man, heart check right now. There's been some people who've been triggering me, and I have not been responding well. So God, what's that about? And I've had amazing moments at an altar, kneeling down where God's spirit has just clearly began to articulate the places in my life that I just need to say, here I am, broken, 
please, God, give me grace. Give me grace. So let's do this. Let's stand to our feet. For not all of us, maybe we don't need to go to the altar. That's okay. But the team's going to sing a song. But if you need to respond, maybe you've been believing the lies of insecurity. Maybe you've been going to places and hiding. Maybe you've been creating narratives. Maybe you just need to say, God, please show me your grace. Let's open up the altars. Maybe for some of you, you just want to go sit by the cross or go in the prayer room. Just, just have a moment. But this is your time. Allow God to minister. Allow his spirit to speak to you.